Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure being back. I think it's been a little bit of a while. Yeah, it's been about a month. And I just wanted to first touch on the precious metal markets because since the beginning of the year, gold and silver have been rising. Gold is up about over $100 and silver is up over $2. Now, what is your perspective on the rise we've been seeing and where do you see them heading? I just looked over the charts and included a good deal of technical analysis in the February gold report for the Hattrick letter. And I concluded that silver is now leading. Uh, silver has a short-term breakout. Silver, depending on how many years back you consider intermediate term, silver has what is approaching as an intermediate term breakout. And uh, I think in a matter of, of several months, it, it could actually come, come to pass. Whereas gold is not even in a short-term breakout and is not definitely in any kind of an intermediate breakout. It has enormous resistance uh, up to 1350. Uh, silver has resistance at 20, but it has a short-term breakout. Take a look at the short-term daily chart. You see a, you see a, a move above a, a downtrend line in silver and not in gold. Now, bear in mind, I've always been kind of insulting of, of uh, chart analysis that relies on the COMEX chart because it's so fraudulent. But, you know, given that it's fraudulent, we can still look at it. And I, I do look at it from time to time. Um, where is it heading? Well, I think the dollar's heading for the dustbin of history. It's the most toxic, fraudulent currency in over 2,000 years since the Roman Empire. Now, the Romans at least, they called it sovereignty. The, the Romans at least left in 10% of the gold for their coins as the emperor stole the other 90%. In the United States, Bush and Clinton, they stole 100% with Reuben's help of the gold. So, you know, we do better than the Roman Empire did in our fraud. We take it to a new level. We steal the entire thing and claim it's not stolen, don't do an audit, and dare anybody to speak otherwise. And any state that likes to uh, challenge it, they're going to have a lot of difficulties like Texas chemical plant fires, things like that. That's a, a whole new level of crime syndicate above the Roman Empire. Now, you, we joke about how Nero played the violin while Rome burned. Uh, well, Obama played golf while Rome burned. Uh, Obama set the record for the most golf outings, the most fundraising meetings, and the most vacation days. Okay, where's gold and silver heading? <sighs> Well, we require a few critical steps, but I think we're going to be seeing them, and I don't know how soon, but I think we're going to see a, a really powerful breakout in silver. Back in 2011, it, it shot up to 50 and then lost all of its, its uh, steam. But I, I think we're going to see silver moving above 100, and we're going to see gold follow with a lot more difficulty and resistance because most of the attention is given to gold. Look, we, we have a good breakout. We could have a tripling of the silver price to, to 56, and, and gold struggle at 1350. And uh, it, it'll make some news, but because gold hasn't confirmed, it won't be really earth-shattering news. But I think we're heading toward uh, you know a situation where silver is way over 100 and gold is way over 3,000. Uh, I like to, to tell the uh, the quick stories, and I probably related this a month ago with you, your your listeners. If you want to buy a hundred million dollars worth of gold, you have to pay an eighty percent price premium. So the price for gold is at least two thousand dollars an ounce now, unless you're buying what they throw on the floor, in the form of numerous coins as breadcrumbs for the masses at the discount price. Just because you can buy a few cold coins at 1300 give or take, 
doesn't mean that's the gold price. Try buying $100 million worth of gold bars, and then you find out the real gold price. 80% price premium. And this is not just from one or two examples. It's, it's from a, n a number of them, and The Voice has access to several of these stories. Uh, there's also a price premium for buying a, 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 you know, a, a small truckload of silver bars. It's, you know, 50, 70, 80 percent, 100 percent price premium. The current price is not the price. It's what they put as what you need to pay for floor scraps. They toss it at their feet and say, gobble these up, you minions, and be sure to believe that that's the real price. But it's not the real price. You have something like 300 or 400 Paper claims per physical ounce of gold right now. That's ridiculous. Can you imagine 300 people laying claim to a single property, a house, a residential property, where all of them want the keys to the door to live in it? What would the house price be? Surely not the discounted price like Comex does for gold and silver. Anyway, let's move on. Now, last time we had you on, we talked about a Trump presidency because Trump had just been inaugurated as the 45th president of the United States. Now that it's been about a month since he's been in office, can you give us your take on his presidency so far? Well, it's very hard to say his presidency so far. Um, he's had time to fight on some of his cabinet appointments. Uh, he's had time to declare certain commissions. He's had time to declare some plans for economic revival, um, and some of them sound good, but there's, there's, there are a couple points that I think bear mention, and one is he has declared war against the narcotics wing of the Langley CIA. He wants to shut down the narco money trafficking. He wants to shut down the movement of money out of Afghanistan. Uh, it's really by means of uh, what used to be the uh, Import-Export Bank of, of Iraq. No, I think called the Export Bank of Iraq. Um, <clears throat> he wants to stop the funding of certain wars and factions like ISIS from narcotics money that Wall Street benefits from and that Langley elements profit to the tune of $800 billion a year, namely the Bush crime family. When Papa Bush came out with his wife both in wheelchairs uh, to start off the Super Bowl in Houston, Texas, where the Bush family residence is, I turned the channel because I didn't want to vomit on my television. So the man responsible for running the Kennedy assassination and the advancement of narcotics across the world, a man who's worth at least three and maybe five trillion dollars, is being revered at the Super Bowl? Let me vomit, please! <clears throat> very, very disturbing. But uh, the point is, the America First movement, which was of the dismissed 500 generals and admirals uh, by Clinton, Bush, II, and Obama, they organized. They organized their movement, was called America First, and if you listen to the inauguration by Trump, you would have heard him mention America First at least five or six times. He wasn't saying, put American first, put America and Americans first. He was saying, we just had a coup d'etat, and we're going to follow it through to push out the narco barons and the fascists who are in league together with several corporate sectors. Therefore, Langley is now trying to sabotage him. They sabotaged his appointment for National Security Advisor Flynn. Uh, they revealed some classified data, blamed it on the Flynn office. It's a lot more complicated than that. But here's the upshot of, of what I'm seeing, a couple main points. Trump is probably going to put forth in three or four 
posts, maybe more, uh, a yes man, a cabinet puppet, to put before the Congress so they will not object. So the replacement for Flynn, who was very much anti-Langley, anti-narco, anti-war, anti-Russian war, Flynn has been removed from the official post, very important point, official post of National Security Advisor. McMaster's, who's very much a Russian hawk, he wants war with Russia, he doesn't trust them, he thinks they're aggressive, he thinks they're expanding, he thinks they're dangerous on every border. <laughs> it's such a joke. It's all propaganda nonsense by the narcos. Apparently McMaster's now is in the lead spot for the NSA spot, for the National Security Advisor spot, which oversees 16 different intelligence organizations. Well, that could be the guy who never really does much of, in the way of attending meetings with the Trump inner circle. I don't think Flynn is going anywhere. He's just not going to be in that official post. So he's working toward a shadow cabinet. And this is some of the inside scoop that I've gotten. The shadow cabinet will be where the real decisions are made, where the real... Uh, implementation of plans will be carried out where the real power will lie and they will not go before the Congress. So I don't ever remember a president in the past <clears throat> having intelligence and security posts as part of a secret inner circle, unless you count the Trilateral Commission for Papa Bush, Baby Bush and Clinton, uh, the Trilateral commission with, you know, Brzezinski and, and the others like Soros and others that, that want to carry out the globalist fascist state. Whenever you hear globalist, think fascist state that cuts across national boundaries. Continental fascist state. Um, the second important point regarding Trump is, is a little disappointing on my side. And I'll, I'll try to be brief because it's really complicated. It looks like Trump may not cut any military budget. Uh, I think it needs to be cut by $200 billion so we could do some infrastructure projects. How many bridges and highways could be fixed with $200 billion a year? Instead, it looks like he's trying to move the boogeyman role over to Iran. And there, there's some, you know, National Security Advisor... Uh, uh, hubbub rumors regarding Flynn that he was about to reveal the really ugly, scummy details of the Iran nuclear deal with respect to United States, Iran, and the sanctions. So that won't come out so quickly. But it looks like Iran is being painted as the boogeyman, and uh, you know they're the problems all through the Middle East, what stupidity. Uh, that's disappointing, because I don't think Iran is much of a threat to anything in world peace, but they are a threat to the dollar. And that's the common theme that goes back to the Saddam Iraq days, because he was selling oil for euros. The common theme in the Ur Ur Ukraine war, because the dollar was being threatened by a, a Russian energy supply, which was going to undermine completely the petrodollar and, and weaken the Saudi link. Okay. The other disappointments that I, I see in Trump uh, have to do with you know, plans that don't involve any kind of a fast track toward retiring the dollar and, and creating a more legitimate currency that would have gold backing. And I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. The first has to do with uh, you know, funding the, the major programs. Uh, how is Trump going to put out a trillion dollar infrastructure portfolio of projects if we're in the middle of a currency crisis and we don't even know what our national currency is anymore because it's going to be unblurred from the global currency, the dollar. 
Well, he needs funding. So if he, want, if he needs a trillion dollars in funding, he's going to have to probably expand the U.S. government debt. And it has to be on the back of this continued, crippled, toxic dollar. Okay, so he needs to continue the dollar. And that's, I think, why Goldman Sachs boys are in there in the cabinet. Very disappointing. They're just loaded with Goldman Sachs. And remember, Donald Trump overcame at least two bankruptcies, which means he has big friends in the banking sector. All right, the second reason why the dollar is not going to be on a fast track toward the funeral is that if we bring about a gold-backed new dollar, Elijah, the first year, if there's no reduction to the trade deficit, and even it, let, let's just assume that there's a minor reduction down to say 500 billion or the upper 400 billion area in dollars, annual trade deficit. If we do a gold backing of the dollar, that means we will forfeit 12,000 to 13,000 tons of gold in the first year. And with grand improvements, maybe only forfeit 9,000 tons in the second year. And 7,000 tons in the third year. Like 30,000 tons forfeited in three years. That's a consequence of getting onto a gold-backed dollar. We need to fix U.S. industry and reindustrialize the nation before we even contemplate a gold-backed dollar. And no country in its right mind will lease the United States 10,000 tons of gold when the trade deficit beneficiaries will have claims on it in the first year. People just don't think this through. That's why the hat trick letter is unique. We need a legitimate dollar, but before that, we need to reindustrialize the United States and reverse this stupidity of outsourcing industry that Germany never did, and therefore they're not crippled. We need to reverse the outsourcing because it's a legitimate source of income, and if done, results in a massive trade deficit that's very difficult to overcome because you have to re-industrialize. Okay, the optimism that I see regarding Trump is his innovative thought. He might be trying to arm twist Japan into investing a trillion dollars, that's a thousand billion dollars from their pension funds or maybe even from their treasury bond hoard at their central bank. That's two different trillion dollars. He might be trying to arm twist Japan into being involved with some massive industrialization and infrastructure plan. You can't reindustrialize the United States without a certain amount of infrastructure upgrade. Okay, that's really important. Uh, it's like saying, well, we're going to build a business over there, but uh, first we need to improve the rail facility. We need to improve a truck depot. And we need to expand the highways and improve some ramps to the, the different plants. Okay, that's infrastructure to support a capital investment. Capital formation requires the infrastructure. It's like saying, I just bought a new car, but I wish there were some roads that I could drive it on. Okay, that's the infrastructure. Walmart would say, we need, we need to supply our... Our, our various 2,000 stores in the United States, but we don't have any truck depots for distribution center. That's your infrastructure. Okay. So <clears throat> there's some things to be optimistic about with Trump, but, uh, you know, I, I just don't know how dirty some of his people are. I don't know how much... How many skeletons does Trump have in the closet? If he has any, they're going to be used against him to forestall his plans. And I just don't know how much we can get done. I think in two years' time, remember back after the first two years of Obama, change you can believe in, everybody was laughing. You know, we haven't had any change at all. I think with Trump, we're going to have some very minor change. It might be symbolic, 
there might be some legitimate changes, but I think we're going to be disappointed in the extraordinary slow pace of cleaning the swamp because he's got a couple swamp members in his cabinet. Do you really think the Pentagon is going to just say, hey, whatever you say, we can live with a 30% budget cut? Yeah! We can reduce the wars? Yeah! That's not the way things work in the real world. I think the Pentagon is going to try to maybe stir things up with China, stir things up more with Iran, and try to upgrade the depleted U.S. military that's been overstretched for years with Iraq and, and Syria and Ukraine. We don't have really much present, presence with the U.S. military in Ukraine, but we do in Afghanistan. And from what I'm hearing, we're getting really hit hard in Afghanistan. And uh, part of what we're doing there is guarding the poppy fields to make sure that all the costs for producing heroin are covered by the taxpayer. 1,300 tons of heroin a year coming out of Afghanistan through NATO Air Force bases. $800 billion a year in profit to the Bush crime family. Is anybody paying attention to this? Price of heroin on the U.S. streets is a third to 20% of what it used to be 10 years ago. In the year 2000, heroin had a certain presence on U.S. city streets. Now it has a, a 7%. Now it is 70% and the price is way down. Heroin is now cheaper in, in some communities than marijuana. Is anybody paying attention to what Afghanistan and the war is all about? Capturing the heroin monopoly for the Bush family. Now, let me answer the question. Very few Americans are aware. Very few Americans are paying attention to the real things regarding the government, fascist state, narcotics, Wall Street dependence, military kickbacks, failed weapon systems that continue to get trillion dollar funding. Very few Americans have any idea what the hell's going on. They're very distracted. They're very dumb. And the Hetrick letter, Elijah, is designed for the 10% <clears throat> who don't fit those ugly characteristics. Now, I'd like to move our focus to the gold trade note because I re uh, your recent article discussed this and how basically you see the gold trade note, basically all the everything lining up for it to be finally introduced. So can you discuss or give us an update on where the gold trade note stands right now and how, as you describe it, when it gets introduced, that basically means the dollar has died? Well, the gold trade note, when it's introduced formally, will mean the dollar death knell is ringing so loud that all the financial analysts and the financial hedge funds and the financial firms will be paying very close attention to this. In other words, the funeral date will have been announced for the dollar. What is the gold trade note? Okay, let's, let's do a preliminary. Let's, let's first talk about the Iran-India oil deal, oil for gold. Back in 2012 or so, I think it was 12, I, I, I have trouble with the actual date. We had the U.S. government slap on Iran sanctions. We did not invade Iran because they're twice as powerful as Iraq and three times as many people as Iraq, and their generals weren't a bunch of ragtag cowards like Iraq. In other words, Iran was a formidable foe. So all we did with them when they did pretty much the same thing as Saddam did, sell oil outside the dollar, we did something different with Iran. We just put on sanctions, and, and we got called down for it, and that's why Obama is delivering you know, <laughs> tens of billions of dollars, and I think some penalties too, uh, because of improper seizure of Iranian funds and assets. 
Okay, so Iran went about and sold oil to India. This is this is really it got stepped up a lot around 2014. It was developed and really humming efficiently. Iran delivered oil to India. India used some of its big money to buy Turkish gold and deliver the Turkish gold to the biggest banks of Iran, which moved it quickly internal to the country, to their central bank. The Obama nitwits, being amateurs and total idiots about most everything they did, uh, without any understanding of consequences, they set up the Iran sanctions to include just the Iran central bank, but not the major banks. So, in very easy manner, the Iranians accepted gold from Turkey, paid for by India, at their major banks. Oh, boy. The Iran for oil trade. All right, so that was the model. <clears throat> now move to, say, late 2014, early 2015, where Russia sold or made contracts and began selling enormous tracts of oil to China and accepted RMB. When I, whenever I say RMB, just think Chinese currency, Chinese yuan, I, I, RMB is easier to say. I, I don't like using the word yuan because it's confusing with yen, it's confusing with yuan, which are the Japanese and the Korean currencies. Imagine the West having a dollar, a dollar, and a, and a dollar. I mean, gosh, it would be very confusing. So the Chinese RMB was used to pay Russia for a lot of oil deals and some LNG gas deals. But it, it got bigger than that because Russia and China sold a giant pipeline contract construction deal, which the Russians would do most of the work for and be paid in treasury bonds that China would hold, that China ha holds in its reserves. So the Russian energy sector, both for, for oil and gas, but also in pipeline construction and maybe even some LNG facilities on the Pacific coast near in, in the uh, Sea of Kirkutsk, uh, all paid in RMB and treasury bills. Treasury bonds. Well, I guarantee you that the Russians would take the treasury bonds and fortify their own currency. The Russians are not suffering anything like what the U.S. press describes. The U.S. press is not describing properly the pain in the United States from the damage of QE and the, and the monetary policy of buying up treasury bonds with fake money. <laughs> it's funny how the fake news doesn't talk about the fake money. Oh, boy, I tell you, it's so sickening. <clears throat> All right, so the model is there for the Russians to be paid outside the dollar. Let's just say outside the dollar uh, in RMB. And they're taking the RMB currency in billions, going to Shanghai, using the billions in RMB to buy gold, using the formalized contract in the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and carting off the gold. Okay, there you have it. It's more streamlined than the Iranian purchase, I mean, than the purchase from Iran, of oil paid with Turkish gold by India. This is much slicker. So, when the new Shanghai oil contract comes into view in the next few months, which has already been heralded, <coughs> it's already been announced, when that RMB oil contract comes in, all you need is linkage with the RMB gold contract, and you have the makings of a gold trade note for use in the oil sector, which is the primary commercial trade sector in the global economy. Now, notice what the United States did with Saudi cooperation, or collusion might be a better word. We created the petrodollar standard, where the Saudis only accepted dollars for their oil and kept all of their surplus from the oil business in the form of treasuries. So the oil sales never got converted 
after payment into non-dollars, except for what they needed to run their economy. Okay, well, that meant that the Saudis accumulated three or four trillion dollars in the 30 and 40 year period, and we falsified the tick reports to make it look like the Saudis and the OPEC nations only had 100 or 200 billion dollars, when really part of the deal was that they had to supply the Department of Treasury with a three trillion dollar core fund called the Exchange Stabilization Fund, which we will steal. But, you know, it's not stolen if it was part of the agreement that the Saudis would build it and leave it and not ever touch it. No, we're just stealing what they could never have anyway, anyway. <clears throat> boy, oh boy, oh boy. The, o the U.S. dollar financial structures are so rotten, so ugly, so corrupted that they cannot last. All right, back to the Russians and the Chinese. They have the components. As soon as the RMB futures contract is up and running in Shanghai for oil. We have the components for the gold trade note to be used and devoted primarily for the energy sector. Okay. When we see the first gold trade note used, I guarantee you it will be to purchase oil. When that happens, the gold trade note can then later be expanded to cover, say, grain shipments for soybeans, corn, wheat. It could be extend, expanded for other dry goods like lumber or cement. It could be used then later for container vessels from Asia, loaded, you know, a big vessel loaded with several hundred, if not over a thousand containers that end up on the, the back of a truck moving to Walmart and, you know, other places like Staples and Target, all those places that are now selling Asian-made goods. Hey, let me, let me just be very clear. No nation ever can thrive by selling on a mass basis foreign-made goods. No nation can ever thrive by being focused on consumption and not investment. And the United States fails on both sides. And give a lot of credit to the Rockefeller Foundation, which advised on both fronts toward the destruction of the country, which was their plan. They have many different pieces toward that plan. Destruction of the U.S. economy, because it is the biggest threat to the globalist 